Greetings friends, welcome to Sawgrass Doctrine. This here we are continuing to look at the New Testament Church Age, a history of the New Testament Church Age, and began to consider their last time the seven churches of Asia. And we want to look, uh, we'll start back here again in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4 where he said, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come, from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him ever so, or even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. The Almighty God hath set these things in order and brought them to pass, Jesus Christ being a part of that trinity, that he being the part, of, he is the second part of the Godhead, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't matter whether men want to believe that or not. It's so. It's a fact. Where God says it, that settles it. Things which God's Word sets forth that declares unto us plainly His workings and His plan and purpose in this life bring about His will. It's not our will, but it's the will of God that He hath saved the people unto Himself and He'll make us priests and kings over His and uh, rule by his side during that millennial reign, and that as he writes now these seven uh, letters to seven churches, and through the uh, Apostle John, he gives them these statements. Now, of course, we're not going to read those seven letters, or what it says this time, but in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, you find the letter to the church at Ephesus. Now, what is it we can learn about Ephesus? We're going to consider the historical facts about these seven places, these seven churches that existed at that time, and the conditions and what's happened to them. Now, Ephesus then, the metropolis, met metropolis of Asia, of the Asian church, had withstood indeed the Gnostic errors predicated by Paul and faithful, main faithfully maintained the purity of the doctrine delivered to it but it had lost the, the the door of its first love, and it is therefore earnestly exhorted to repent. It thus represents to us that state of dead, petrified orthodoxy, in which under which various churches oft times fall. Zeal of pure doctrine is indeed of the highest importance but worthless without living piety and active love. So our list is true, that we ought to love one another, and that if we, in our zeal to live and to obey God, we forget love, and to live godly, even as the spokes of uh, piety, if we put uh, value upon the things of this world and uh, let uh, the knowledge of God and the holy uh, drive us to the extreme, we become unprofitable. And we have not the love that we ought to have. Certainly in love, we ought to go forth. And This is one of the things which we have seen in this history is that that love that he speaks of here, that the so-called churches or those that persecuted other Christians, they lost that love. They didn't do it in love. I'm sure in their opinions they were. They were trying to save them. But brethren, God did not command us to fight. And that is the evidence of his true churches that they did not fight. They did not raise up arms. They did not raise up armies. They could have. In the beginning days, his true churches will find we're in the majority. The time of Constantine, the time of the beginning of Catholicism, they were a minority. And that's even shown in the number of bishops that answered his call. That they were a minority that came together and began to do those things. We'll see that as we get into it. Now, as the church at Ephesus, church of Smyrna, 
Church of Smyrna is uh, very ancient, still a flourishing commercial city in Ionia, beautifully located on the Bay of Smyrna, was extremely poor, persecuted, and had still greater tribulation in view, but is cheered with prospect of a crown of life. It was in the second century ruled by Polycarp, a pupil of John, and faithful martyr. John, or that is Polycarp being one who was brought up under John's teaching and being one of those that uh, though, uh, many look to for succession of churches, successive line, we'll get into this eventually, we'll show you it's not just a, a line of a few individuals, but it's a great broad line that we can look to with great joy that God's churches were blessed abundantly. But Polycarp eventually being martyred. Now, that way it's in uh, Revelation chapter 2 verses 8 through 11. Chapter 2 verses 12 through 17 we find the church of Pergamon. Pergamon and Mysia, the northmost of these seven cities, formerly the residence of King uh, for, uh, the residents of the kings of Asia of the Athelian dynasty and renowned for its large library of over 20,000 volumes and manufacture of parchment. Hence the name Tartaprophilia. Now Bergamo, a village inhabited by Turks, Greeks, and Armenians was the seat of a church which under trying circumstances had shown great fidelity but tolerated in her bosom those who held dangerous Gnostic errors for this want and rigid for this one of rigid discipline she also is called to repent so early as we see the examples of these that uh, even though after people are saved, sometimes they, the world, uh, they get caught up in other things in the world and ideals that are not of God and we're commanded to repent of those things too. And certainly we do believe in the security of the believer. But that does not prevent believers from getting into error, getting caught up in the world and doing things which they ought not. Even Paul himself speaks of these like things, that there were things he said that he ought not do that he did things that he said that he should have done that he didn't do. Now, our next church, Revelation 2, verses 18 through 29, the church of Thyatira. Church of Thyatira, a flourishing manufacturing and commercial city in Lydia, on the, si <clears throat> on the site of which now stands a considerable Turkish town called Akashar, or the White Castle with nine mosques and one Greek church. So there's you have one of the uh, splinter groups. Uh, the Greek church is one of the factions that came out of Catholicism, one of the uh, three that came out of it. Uh, that's before, my friends, that's before the Protestants came out. Uh, Catholicism suffered two major divisions that occurred, and we'll get to those eventually. But uh, you had to, well, the Greek church is the latter. And when the Greeks come out, the Greek church came out, that was the latter of the two divisions that occurred with them. Uh, but anyway, it was very favorable, distinguished for self-denying, self-denying, act of love, and patience. But was likewise too indulgent towards errors which corrupted Christianity with heathen principles and practices. My friends, it's sad to say that we have many heathen principles and practices flourishing in the churches today in the times in which we live. We've learned the ways of the heathen. We've learned their customs, their traditions. And they are much too prevalent within us. Such as the evidence of the seventh church age which you're in. Now, Chapter 3 of Revelation, starting in verse 1 through 6, we find the church of Sardis. The church of Sardis, till the time of Corsus, the flourishing capital of the Ladian Empire, but now a miserable hamlet 
of shepherds had indeed the name and outward form of Christianity, but not its inward power of faith and life. Hence it was on the brink of spiritual death, yet distinguishes from the corrupt mass of a few souls which had kept their walk undefiled without, however, breaking away from the congregation as separatists and setting up an opposition sect for themselves. This here being that state of that church there, things unfolding within it that, had, that occurred to that city and that place there. Now, in Revelation 3, verse 7 through 13, we have the church of Philadelphia, 6 to 7. Philadelphia, a city built by King Atlas and named after him, now Alashkar, in the province of Lydia, a rich wine region, but subject to earthquakes, was a seat of a church likewise poor and small outwardly, but very faithful and spiritually flourishing, a church which was to have all the tribulations and hostility it met with one earth met with on earth abundantly rewarded in heaven certainly reward in heaven reward of escaping even that great tribulation that's promised to those or churches like that and these seven particular churches represent seven churches little churches at that time they can also be literal churches in any age, that is, that these types of churches can exist and have existed in all the ages, varying spiritual conditions, and they do represent seven church ages, as we said, we will deal with that later on. Now, the seventh church, the church of Laodicea, in Revelation 3, four, uh, verses 14 through 22, now the church of Laodicea is a wealthy commercial city of Phrygia not far from Colossae and Heliopolis, where now stands only a desolate village by the name of Iskar Hashar, probably or proudly fancied itself spiritually rich and faultless, but was in truth poor, blind, and naked, and in that most dangerous state of indifference and lukewarmness from which it is more difficult to return to the former decision and adore than it was to pass at first from the natural coldness of faith. Hence the fearful, fearful threatening, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Lukewarm water is said to produce vomiting. Yet even the Laodiceans are not driven to despair. The Lord in love knocks at the door and promises them and on condition of through repentance a part in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Certainly the churches of the Lord make up the bride of Christ. And that marriage supper can be found in the book of Revelations. And after these seven letters to these seven churches, in that time period, considering that, we don't see the church after that. The church age comes to an end, and the time of great tribulation comes upon this world. Also, so, oh, but who's going to preach the gospel to this world during that age? Well, there's 144,000 Jewish men that God's going to call forth to preach his word. And then there's going to be two witnesses also that come about preach the word of God the, the age will come to an end things will change and the time of God's wrath will be upon this world his pouring out of judgment and there will be those that hear and believe upon him even in that time and martyrs will die and be beheaded during great tribulation for their faith in the son of God in Jesus Christ he'll still be saving people but these seven churches that existed, and these seven church ages, which also have come to pass, we're in that seventh church age now, my friends, the days which we're living. 
time in which the churches of God, I fear, are not as rich as they think they are. They're not as faultless as they think they are. And we have allowed the world to blind us. We're allowing the world to take away from us the Word of God. If you have, if you're no longer using a King James Bible, my friends, if your church is not using a King James Bible, then the Word of God's been taken away from. You only got a part of it, and depending on which new Bible you're using, you may have very little of any of it, because they have made these off corrupted manuscripts that were made by ungodly men power and the working of Satan to lead people astray from the truth and after lies. Telling them that all oh, that uh, it's full of errors. It's not any good. That King James is not any good. But it is. It's pure. It's, it's, it's faultless. And it is the same as all those early translations. They're all the same. All those early English translations all say the same thing up to the King James. You're talking about seven or eight of them there. And I know there are those that speak of the other languages that existed. They say those say the same thing. But all here we are, we're, you know, uh, 2,000, almost 2,000 years later. Well, you can go back a couple hundred years, 1,800 years later. They're saying, oh, we don't have the word God. We don't have the word God. What foolishness. God preserved his churches. His churches were there. His churches are here now, and the word of God is with us. We have the Word of God that we ought to learn and live by it. Boldly stand upon it as the Word of God and believe the gospel which is set forth in it. The gospel in itself is the gospel. And I don't care what Bible a person packs in their hand, if they're declaring the gospel, it's the gospel. But after receiving the gospel, being saved, and then being baptized, that's the proper order of things, that you must first believe, and that gift of faith and repentance comes together in life and all. God gives you the gift of, uh, cause you to repent. He gives you the gift of faith and gives you everlasting life all at an instant, moment of time, so they come hand to hand together. You can't have one without the other. And then He leads you to follow Him in baptism. Baptism doesn't save us. It is a figure. It's a symbolic action where even as Christ was buried in the earth and arose from the grave, that we are buried in the water, and that we arise from water, showing that as we're buried in the water, we're dead to the old nature, we're dead to the old self, we're dead to the old man, and that we now have a new nature, we have new desires, we have a new will, that we now want to live for God and not for self. And this is not the condition you're in, my friend, I'd say perhaps you're still lost. Or maybe you've gotten so much into the world that you've lost sight of what true Christianity is. But that you ought to live for God, and God commands us to repent and turn from our ways, at least that in this age, at least he would spew us out of his mouth, because it just makes God sick. To see his people so caught up in the things of this world, and the traditions, and the customs, and things that are not of God. These things which have so infiltra infiltrated Christianity, and they're not in the Word of God. They're not in the Bible. That is, in the sense that they're not there, that we're not commanded to do many of the things we do today. Just like those Jews at the time of Christ, they had many uh, doctrines and things that they taught that were of themselves and not of God. They changed their religion dr drastically, teaching the commandments of men rather than the commandments of God. That's the same condition, my friends, the churches of God in this age in which we live, we find that they're teaching the commandments of men and the ideas, the philosophies of men, and more so and more so as we see the days go by here. Teaching that works save you, the baptism saves you, the Lord's Supper saves you, all these are lies, they're deceptions. You are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and His shed blood, which has covered us, oh, he's paid our sin debt and covered us with his blood. To those that he died for and that he paid their debt, God does not see any debt there anymore. They may not yet be born. They may not yet have been born again even. But yet God sees them as his children because he's already paid their debt. Even though they're not born again yet, they're not born yet physically into this world, but yet they're still his and they will be when the appropriate time comes. 
even as we all are. That's the providence of God. That God is bringing about this which he declared. He has established the end from the beginning. None of this has taken God by surprise. He's unfolding it just as he determined he would. Now, John finished off that book there, and we'll deal more with it later. Uh, later on, uh, you, you can look and find eventually, we'll go through that book of Revelations. We haven't already by the time you're seeing this. Uh, in the year 98 A.D., Timothy, the spiritual son, that's a, and that's spiritual, not his literal son, but spiritual son, he's like a son unto him, Paul the Apostle, that is, is stoned to death by the heathen, heathen idolaters at Ephesus. Many of the, well, there are many of those beloved apostles and people of God you read about by this point, they're all dead except for one, that is John the Apostle. He is the only one. In the year 100 A.D., as far as John goes, that beloved disciple was brother to James the Great, the churches of Smyrna, Pergamon, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Thyatira were founded by him. From Ephesus he was ordered to be sent to Rome, where it is affirmed he was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil. He escaped by miracle, that is, God preserved him. It wasn't time for him to die yet, because he had to go to, to the Patmos to write the, the uh, book of Revelations for sure, not perhaps a few others there. But, but without injury, Domitian afterwards banished him to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation. Nerva, the successor of Domitian, was, recalled him. That is, uh, the emperor that came after him called John back. He was only the he was the only apostle to escape a violent death. He didn't die by a violent death. He wasn't martyred. He was the only one of them that did not die by that means. But we would say this too that he's not still alive. Well, there's some that take uh, what's said in the Gospel of John, and even there is uh, Simon Peter asks, well, "What about him, Lord?" The Lord said, "Well, what is it if I will that he abide till I come back? What is it that he?" No, he has an abide. I don't believe that he's sitting out there somewhere in a hiding place. He's a very old man now, some almost 2,000 years, waiting for the return of the Lord. No, he's passed on. But he did not die that martyr's death. He was allowed to die of old age. For that day of Pentecost in Acts, now 100 A.D., 67 years have passed. And all these things haven't come to pass. And 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And indeed that, my friends, is what we see according to the Word of God. And these times in which we live, these, uh, I don't know, they're sad times, really. That so many people don't even, uh, you know, but, the world is changing in such an ungodly way to where that uh, wickedness is abounding. Uh, that which is evil is being exalted as good. That which is truly good is rebuked as being evil. The days are truly like the days of Noah. They're like the days of Lot. How many more signs do we need around about us to know what times we're living in? To know and to realize that we are in the latter days of this church age and that our Lord and Savior is coming back sooner than we might think. Still, we cannot put a time upon it. We can't say, well, tomorrow is coming or the next, uh, the next day or a month from now or a year from now. No man knows the day nor the hour, but he is coming. And in faith we look up and we'll be looking up and knowing and seeing by the signs of the times that yes, indeed, the time show us that his return is nigh. We can discern the signs of the times. And the conditions of those that profess Christianity. And how lukewarm they are and how ungodly they are. Where is the Christ likeness in God's people? 
when so many so-called Christian churches and religions today are denying the very Word of God, They've been denying many things about him for quite some time now, for many years. Denying his virgin birth. Denying his deity. Denying that he is God. Penknifing the word of God. And watering it down so that you have all these modern so-called Bibles. that are not Bibles. They're not the word of God. They contain parts of the word of God. But they're not the word of God, my friends. We need to get back to the standard. We need to get back to that which the saints of old were talking for the, roughly the first 1800 years that the saints of God held to those writings as the word of God and they honored it and preserved it to be so. God has preserved his word. He, he uh, inspired his word. It was wrote. It was given to us. It was given to the Jews and the Hebrew and in the, in the Greek and the New Testament. And now we have those that, uh, and I have no doubt that this is the Jewish persuasion. They want to go back and say, oh, well, we need to go back to the Hebrew word for Christ. We need to go back to the Greek word for Christ. Well, they're going back to the Hebrew word. My friends, the New Testament was given to us in Greek. And it's the Greek word for Christ that we should understand. And that they're being uh, translated over into your language, and if it's English, such as mine, I'm an English-speaking, understanding individual. And in the English, my Savior's name is Jesus. And there is no other name given whereby I must be saved. Now, if you speak French, then whatever his name is in French. If you speak Russian, it's whatever his name is in Russian. If you speak Greek or Hebrew, if that's your native, native tongue, then it's whatever it is in your native tongue. It's not one language for all of us to learn and go to. It's God who has given all of us our languages. God hath appointed the bounds of our habitation, my friends, and God is the one who hath given us our language and our ability to speak and understand it. And it's God who hath sent the gospel to each of us in our languages, for there on the day of Pentecost you have some roughly about 15 nationalities of people that when Simon Peter stood up there and preached the word of God to them, they all heard it in their native tongue. Now that's the working and the power of God that one man can speak and all those different people and all those different nations can hear it in their tongue. And when he said Jesus, every single one of them heard that name in their language pronounced like it would be in their language. That's how God has sent forth the gospel to this lost and dying world in your language, that you might hear and believe the gospel. And in that name, you must be saved. For by that name, he hath revealed himself unto you. To the English-speaking people, he's revealed himself unto us as Jesus, the Christ, the only begotten of the Father, second part, second head of the Trinity. He's a part of the Godhead. And there is salvation in no other but the Son of God, and if they deny Christ, they deny the Father, and they have not either one to stand by their side and to encourage them. They're on their own and they're without hope. Oh, praise be unto God that we are not without hope. For we have our Lord and our Savior. He is with us. The Holy Spirit abides within each of us. They're saved and born again. <coughs> 